let me um, start, um, Sergio, by thanking you for uh, the introduction and making this possible. My Portuguese is not good enough to guarantee that I followed uh, everything, but yes, we've been working for a while to make this happen, and I'm, I'm very grateful to the Foundation for um, accommodating my schedule and, and assembling uh, an impressive audience. Um, what I would like to do um, this afternoon is I, as soon as I figure out how to operate this pointer, closer to the mic. Closer to the mic. Não é mais fácil fazer simplesmente o page down and page up. Let's do it the conventional way. We'll do it the old-fashioned way. As Works they, better. As they say. So the motivation for my uh, talk this afternoon is what I think is widespread discomfort with the uh, operation of our global monetary and financial system and, and the role of, uh, of central banks in its uh, functioning. Um, uh, theme of the uh, Republican primary campaign in the United States and certainly of electoral year politics in the U.S. has been worries about our, our fiat money regime, monetary regime as a potential engine of price and, and financial instability. There are worries about our system of dirty floating exchange rates and how it gives rise to imbalances and volatility. There are worries about whether there will continue to be an adequate supply of international liquidity in uh, a, a, a multipolar world, yet but what is still a, a, a dollar-based international monetary and financial system. And there are worries uh, that you will well know in Brazil about the cross-border spillovers created by national monetary policies about the impact on countries like Brazil of quantitative easing in the United States and, and so forth. So what I want to do in this presentation is to use the long sweep of history to uh, provide some uh, context for these worries and uh, perspective on the future. The history will come mainly at the beginning and at the end and the meat of the sandwich between uh, the two slices of historical bread will be some commentary on, on the current situation as it affects currencies and monetary policies in the U.S., in uh, Euroland, and in China. And I think this afternoon I will probably talk uh, disproportionately about Europe because once again today there have been some rather distressing uh, events on uh, European financial markets and, and some uh, perplexing statements by, by European policymakers. So how have uh, monetary systems evolved in, in the long run? When I think about the long run, I go back 150 years or so, and I distinguish four phases or regimes. There was the long Victorian era, or, or more precisely, the long Victorian and post-Victorian era stretching from the 1870s or so up to the early 1930s, that was the, uh, the period of the gold standard, of course. It was the period when many modern central banks first came uh, into existence, and when central banks uh, basically uh, uh, adhered to uh, rules for gold convertibility and for exchange rate stability, and that was the, uh, the basis on which they formulated monetary policy. They had to keep their, uh, the domestic currency stable against gold. They had to keep their exchange rate stable against the pound sterling. Uh, and that was it to a first uh, approximation. Uh, the reality, of course, was that wasn't exactly it. That wasn't the exactly the totality of monetary policy under the gold standard. Central banks still had some discretion over their collateral policies like they do today. Uh, they could decide what kind of uh, bills to discount, how, what kind of credit, how much credit to provide to the economy within limits. And they did so on the basis of the real bills doctrine. So the idea 
was that central banks would provide credit only in exchange for so-called real bills, only in exchange for credit generated in, in the course of actual business. So they wouldn't provide credit to financial markets. They wouldn't provide credit for speculation. They would only provide credit for business, for the um, legitimate needs of commerce. That's what the real bills doctrine uh, told them they should do. Um, actual fact was that this arrangement didn't work all that well. You can immediately see how operating under the real bills doctrine would make monetary policy very pro-cyclical. You would be providing more credit to the economy when the economy is booming, when business is doing well, and less credit to the economy when it's doing poorly. So uh, uh, a prime example of this would be the Great Depression in, in the United States when business did very poorly. We had a gigantic slump starting in 1929, and the Fed did nothing because it thought uh, business is demanding less credit, so we should provide less credit. Um, and that, in a nutshell, is why the gold standard collapsed globally in the 1930s. What did it give rise to? It gave rise to a long period of government control of monetary policy. So central banks, having not shown themselves to be reliable stewards of the economy, uh, in this earlier period basically came in many countries, including mine, under the direct control of government. That direct control in the U.S. lasted until 1951, and it lasted in, in other places for uh, even longer. There were limits on central bank independence. There were limits on competition in finance. There were limits on international capital flows. Uh, the commitment to stable exchange rates continued to limit the discretion of central banks and governments, but because of the presence of capital controls, they had more room for maneuver than, than before. Phase three, I would call the rise of inflation targeting. So um, after the mid-1970s, you see more and more countries following this man, Alan Bullard, and his country, New Zealand, the first inflation targeter uh, to adopt this new uh, regime. Um, the problem in response to which they did so being that markets were gradually liberalized over time. Exchange rates become more difficult to peg as markets are, are, are decontrolled. That leads to the quest for alternatives, and, and the alternative the new regime has four features. Uh, uh, low and stable inflation as the central bank's key target or, or mandate. Uh, each boat on its own bottom, bottom, which means each national inflation targeter worries about domestic inflation, and that's it. Central banks regain their independence. They're given greater independence, which enables monetary policymakers to pursue that mandate of low and stable inflation. And greater transparency of, of monetary policy making. Central bankers explain what they're doing. They release their minutes. They release votes. That is how they explain their actions, and that's the mechanism through which uh, expectations are managed, and central banks are held accountable for their actions by the polity. Uh, they have to show that the actions they are taking are, in fact, consistent with their mandates. So that's the monetary nirvana at which we thought we had arrived five years ago. And now we realize it's not nirvana, I think. We, uh, inflation targeting, uh, to be provocative, I write here, is dead, or at least it's gravely wounded. Um, I think everyone now understands that central banks cannot simply focus on the inflation problem. They need to worry about the real economy. They need to worry about unemployment as well as inflation. And they need to worry about financial stability as well as uh, price stability. Indeed, there is the possibility, which I think was quite real in the United States, that the more successful they are at um, stabilizing prices and output, the 
more risk they encourage financial operators to take on and the greater the risks to financial stability they themselves create. So this is the story that the great moderation in the United States, the Fed succeeded in taming the business cycle and taming inflation. That led to the great moderation and that encouraged leverage, risk taking and all the things that led up to the bubble and the crisis in 2007. There was the naive belief that central banks could simply focus on price or perhaps price and outs output stability and leave to someone else worrying about financial stability. That was the Greenspan doctrine. It didn't work. There was the belief that the central bank can worry about price stability. It doesn't have to lean against bubbles. And if necessary, it cl can clean up after the, after the bubble bursts at tolerable cost. We found out that that is wrong as, as, as well. The costs can be very great. The regulators can be asleep at the wheel. That's, those two things both happened in the United States in the period leading up to 2007. And I think the belief now is that central banks have to worry about financial stability. They have to address bubbles and excesses in financial markets. They have to figure out how to lean against them before the fact, before they're allowed to get out of hand. And maybe they have to worry more about the cross-border spillovers of, of national monetary policies. So I think people would argue this in Brazil. I'm not sure Mr. Bernanke would acknowledge it. But the Fed has been quite active at extending swaps and, and credits to foreign central banks and providing dollar liquidity that other countries need. The each boat on its own bottom doctrine I think is slowly being modified. So we're moving toward a more complex monetary regime and expanded mandate for central banks um, where more regulatory authority goes back to the central bank. That's what happened in, in Britain. It was all taken away from the Bank of England as part of the bargain that made the BOV, BOE independent in 1998. It's now been given back to the bank. The Fed has gotten more regulatory authority post-crisis. Uh, so central banks' mandates are, are becoming more expansive and more uh, complex. That's a problem. Um, it's more difficult for the public or the politicians to verify that when a central bank does something, that something is consistent with the central bank's mandate because the central bank does one thing, it adjusts interest rates. Is it doing that in pursuit of price stability, output stability, financial stability? Harder to ascertain. Central banks, certainly my own, have increasingly been intruding into um, untraditional areas. They were in, uh, the Fed was involved in the auto bailout in the United States. It has become involved in, in bought buying mortgage-backed securities and the uh, mortgage restructuring issue. It's purchased corporate bonds. Uh, these are more politically sensitive actions than uh, plain vanilla monetary policy. And that makes the central banks, uh, all this makes the central bank's independence problematic. So I think it's no, con no coincidence that the Fed's independence has come under threat, that not only Ron Paul in the US Congress, but a variety of other politicians in the United States question whether a central bank that engages in this wide range of different operations should be so independent uh, from the politicians. I don't think that returning to the, uh, the narrow mandate is an option. Uh, I think we've crossed the Rubicon. I think the financial crisis has taught us that simple recipes for central banking don't work. Central banking is complex business. I think history has also told us that central bank independence is valuable and important. But what that means is that central banks are going to have to fight very, very hard, much harder in the future than they have in the past to defend and maintain their independence. And